Greece. So can I welcome uh, everyone to the 24th meeting of the 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. And we have apologies today from Alec Rowley. And before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind uh, everyone present to switch off their mobile phones, please, as they may affect the broadcasting system. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank um, the departing members of the committee for their work over the past years, uh, particularly Graham Day, uh, our previous convener, um, Alec Neal and Dolan, Donald Cameron. And I welcome Gillian Martin uh, to the committee today. Uh, the first item of business uh, today uh, on the committee's agenda this morning is to consider whether to take item six in private. So shall we take item six in private? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, so we will take item six in private. Um, the second item is the declaration of interests, and, and this is uh, to allow new committee members to declare any interests they may have that are relevant to the work of the committee. Uh, a new member being uh, Gillian Martin. Gillian, is there any uh, relevant interest that you would like to declare? No, I've got no interest to declare. Right. Thank you very much. And so we move now to agenda item three, uh, which is um, the choice of convener. Uh, the Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as convener of this committee. I understand that Gillian Martin is the party's nominee for that post. And so, do we... Yeah. Martin, that's uh, Yes. Um, so, thank you, Richard, for that. Um, do we agree, therefore, to choose Gillian Martin as our convener? Agreed. Uh, that's universal. So, congratulations. Welcome to the chair which I will now vacate, um, and we'll have a brief su suspension just to allow us to do that. OK? Thank you. The fourth item on our agenda this morning is to undertake pre-budget scrutiny of the Scottish Government's budget for 2019 to 2020. We'll take evidence in two panels. In the first panel, we've been joined by Dr Sam Gardner, Acting Director for WWF Scotland, and Dr Mark Williams, Head of Environmental Science and Regulation for Scottish Water. Welcome. Um, we have a number of questions for you, obviously, so I'll go to our first question, and that comes from Richard Lyle. Indeed, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, my question actually is, is um, directed uh, in a lens. On Scottish Water, I noticed from your briefing that you continue to support new housing, economic development across the length and breadth of Scotland, period 2015-2018, over 65,000 new homes, businesses have been connected to your network, and you're, you're forecasting that support for the capacity for these new connections will continue. Could you both tell me how that um, basically, um, how does climate change and any future developments play into your capital spending decisions, mainly to Scottish Water? Okay, so, from a Scottish water perspective, um, climate change obviously has two dimensions, the, the carbon implications of spend uh, and also the climate resilience of the services we provide. So, in terms of the um, climate resilience of, of any flooding or development uh, type implications we're, we're dealing with, what we would do is we've undertaken a number of studies around the climate change implications for Scotland uh, and we're also working to develop the implications for water resources and drainage planning. And these are factored into long-term strategic investment planning that we, we would undertake, so that um, the intent being that uh, future services remain resilient to climate change. From a carbon perspective, um, we measure carbon in two ways. So operational carbon is uh, the, the, the way which we record and report uh, externally, 
Scottish Water's annual contributions to uh, Scotland's uh, climate change, uh, sorry, carbon footprint. Um, and the way we would go through that is basically through a, a very consistent year-on-year -year approach for um, accounting for carbon in our business. Uh, and I say this gives us the overall implications of all our energy usage, uh, chemicals, transport, uh, administration, etc., within uh, Scotland, Scottish Water's footprint. Longer term carbon implications of investment are uh, being picked up through a new approach that we're developing around uh, capital carbon uh, and infrastructure uh, assessment. So, what we would do there is really look at the types of investment we're doing, and we've created a tool that allows our engineers to look at the carbon implications of the, the concrete, uh, all the uh, assets and plant they're using on site to undertake construction activities. And what we're doing there is trying to adopt an approach which is consistent with the past 2080 carbon in, uh, in infrastructure uh, guidance that's available now from British standards. Um, so what we're doing there is really effectively having a tool that allows Scottish Water and its delivery partners to start to account for carbon within the business. Now, we launched that last uh, November time uh, and have undertaken some training uh, and development with, uh, with teams to, to get the engagement with that tool. And what we're effectively doing now is assessing the rollout and the implications uh, of that. Longer term, what we are seeking to try and do now is to actually look at how we um, take carbon into account for longer term planning. Uh, and what that means is we want to really start to understand much earlier in the cycle of planning what the carbon implications may be for investments. So we can start to look at how we factor carbon into the choices we make relatively early. Uh, and within this, what we need to really try and do is come to a very simple understanding of the, um, uh, the relationship between the investment we make and the carbon, uh, the embodied or the um, construction carbon that that actually would entail. So we're still kind of working through that to, to close that piece of work off. Um, but really what we're doing is, is to try and sort of look at the whole life carbon implications of our investment through that approach. Mr Williams, welcome your realistic approach. And basically, um, I'm very pleased to note that you're looking you know, forward to the, the future. Can I take it, do you also, you know, taking that water as a, a very important uh, uh, resource for um, houses and development and, uh, you know, industrial areas, are you, are you pre-planning, uh, looking along with councils or mapping out developments as they take place and to see how you can reduce your carbon? Um, there, there certainly would be opportunities for um, looking more strategically uh, with other partners around this. So um, I suppose to date, uh, we've largely looked internally at Scottish Water's own investment planning. As we go forward, when we'll start to think about more um, wide and broader urban drainage issues, um, the opportunities to work with councils and other partners around finding more sustainable approaches is certainly uh, an area we're keen to explore. Uh, and this is really sort of something that Scottish Water uh, launched earlier this year with its uh, surface water uh, strategy, which is really about how do we work with partners to ensure that we can take a, a more realistic and holistic approach to urban drainage. Wilson has a short supplementary. No. Oh, it's been covered. Okay. Um, move on to a question from John Scott. Um, thank you very much. And I was going to ask you why did you develop your carbon accounting tool, but I think you've explained why and how does the carbon capital carbon accounting tool work in practice. Is there anything more you'd like to say about how it works, please? Yeah, I think the, um, the key to all of this is that um, the industry over the, uh, has over a number of years uh, been engaged in understanding how we need to do this. So operational carbon is relatively straightforward, relatively easy, and we developed the tools around that um, quite early on. So we've been able to develop that consistent record. The issue with capital carbon it, it is much more difficult. It goes to the heart of how we um, think about plan, engage uh, contractors and deliver uh, uh, investment. So it does require a broader um, church of people to be involved in understanding this. Uh, and the key thing we're finding is you need that continual uh, push on engagement to really get it into the, uh, the process. So going forward, you know, we are very keen to see how we build this into decision making in the future rather than bolt, bolt it on. OK, um, thank you very much. I think I'll pass on to the next person. Um, now we have a question from Mark Ruskell. Just wanting to explore that a little bit more detail. So you've had the carbon uh, accounting tool. Has that made any practical difference to the existing programmes that you had around capital infrastructure? And related to that, how does it drive innovation? So I'm aware that, for example, in Stirling, you're, you're trying out some um, 
wastewater heat recovery. It's clearly not a, a commercial technology. It can be applied across every development at this point. But it, how, does it, how does the tool kind of drive that kind of innovation, innovatory work, which can then feed into capital programs at a later date? Well, one of the key things we are um, looking for is to understand where it can drive different thinking. So, um, by and large, uh, um, you know, if you spend a pound, you limit carbon. So, um, if you, you know, historically going for the lowest uh, overall cost solutions, will deliver a lower carbon outcome generally. Uh, generally speaking, what we're interested to understand about this tool is the extent to which it will actually drive further and different thinking around what we do. Um, it's difficult for me to say there has been a direct um, outcome in terms of an innovative difference or a carbon difference we've made because of carbon uh, appraisal, because um, largely we're at the stage of understanding what we've done, assessing and accounting for the, the, uh, the carbon in the capital investments. Uh, that allows us to actually start to demonstrate where um, savings have been made, but I won't, say, I won't pretend that carbon was the driver for that. What we're looking for is how we understand what benefits it gives so we can then look at how we can take that forward in decision making. So, for example, um, you know some of the schemes we've delivered around. Uh, there was a, a scheme at Cowden Beath where we ended up putting in a, a, a more sustainable wetland type uh, solution, um, and overall we saved about 5,000 tonnes of carbon out of out of doing that. Although I won't say I say car carbon was a factor when we understood the the, the totality, but it wasn't the driver for that. Uh, uh, innovation in the first place. So um, what we can look at here is understanding where um, maybe if you just looked at cost, uh, um, you might end up with one outcome. If you factor carbon in, is there anything differently either in the supply chains or anything else you'd actually also do differently uh, around this? So relatively early in the journey on this, but that's certainly something we're looking for. Mm -hmm. okay. Stuart Stevenson had a supplementary question. Uh, I, I just want to explore a little bit uh, with Scottish Water um, how carbon accounting is actually done. Now, specifically what I'm interested in, and I just use this as an example, you will be, in your capital projects, a consumer of cement. Cement is a very high carbon, there's a lot of carbon invested uh, in energy to produce cement, grinding stones down, etc., etc. And I suppose, overall, the question is, to whom should that carbon cost be attributed? Is it to the manufacturer of the cement, which I think it probably should be, rather than to you? And I want to understand that. But I also want to understand um, to what extent you consider the carbon costs that others have incurred, the manufacturer of the cement in the example I'm using, in coming to the decisions you have. Because of course, if we, if we, we're very early in the days of dealing with carbon accounting, and I always get a bit worried we've got danger of double counting or missed counting if we don't have a consistent inputs and outputs approach that we would have in financial terms. And I just wonder if you could talk us through that a little bit. That's very fundamental. Um, so when we report our operational carbon, we do not report the capital carbon because um, the capital carbon very much would uh, draw from the carbon that's emitted by other industries within Scotland and indeed uh, um, if we've imported materials elsewhere. So um, what we're trying to do is look at this from the Scottish water perspective and say where have we had an influence. Um, so we talk about the, the capital carbon as being a part of our um, broader footprint, but it's not the footprint we would report as our contribution to Scotland's emissions. Otherwise, that would be double counting, in, in my view. So what we do is we look at the, um, and the tool has the uh, effectively drop-down um, data sets for carbon in concrete, carbon in the different materials and, and pipe work and whatever that we use. Um, and we try and capture the, the majority or the main items within that drop down. But we certainly wouldn't claim that that's Scottish Water's truest carbon footprint because those would have been effectively accounted for elsewhere within the Scottish economy. What we're trying to do is look at how we use it for um, understanding the carbon implications of our choices of investment uh, and where we might have an influence in the future. Well, oh, let me just on the capital, and, and that's what I hoped I would hear. Uh, therefore, on the capital front, since you don't employ many brickies, you don't grind many stones down to produce cement, I'm actually struggling to work out any capital cost that you incur rather than buy in. Can you give me an example or two just to help me understand? Um, 
I suppose it would be primarily around the on-site activities themselves, so the, um, where we've, um, through a contractor, having to do the land works and uh, the various, um, so the, the diesel used on site, all the various other materials which are direct emissions from the, the activity on site. So effectively, we've, we would bring in material uh, which would have been uh, produced elsewhere in the economy. We have a factor for understanding what that uh, carbon implication of that investment has been. But the emissions that are more directly associated with the, uh, any capital investment would be our actual on-site activities to either ourselves or our contractors. Uh, you have another question you um, want to ask? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll move on to uh, something that's, I've been asked to ask, which I think I should ask. Um, and, and that is, uh, you've developed a tool. Um, to what extent is that tool uh, likely to be useful for other parts of the public sector? and indeed beyond. Uh, you referred earlier uh, to John Scott that you work with partners and councils and house builders and so on and so forth. So clearly there's a collaborative model in the way you think about things. Uh, to what extent uh, is the, the model itself that you've developed, the, the accounting tool you've developed itself going to become part of that collaboration and help others to... Uh, I, th I think there's, there's two, two, two ways to look at this. One is in terms of the principles of the accounting itself. Um, and these are um, what we developed uh, uh, through a project uh, we did with UK Water and Industry Research. So this established the overall kind of, um, kind of cradle to grave type approach to um, capital investment and embodied carbon emissions. Um, so taking those principles which are uh, published and, uh, and available, um, we've then looked at how we build that into a tool for use within, within Scottish Water. One of the key things that uh, we do, again, it, it's a fairly straightforward um, Excel-based tool. It's not, um, not nothing kind of earth-shattering in that, in that regard. It's about having the right boundary settings and having it uh, reported in a way that's useful to our engineers. The key thing we find as we're going through this is whatever organisation is undertaking uh, investment, um, the tool would have to fit with their own systems. So I think the principles absolutely fine. There's nothing that's not transferable within there, and the approach that we've taken, we've taken the carbon factors from sort of broadly available and published and data on carbon metrics, and certainly very happy to talk anybody and take people through that approach. But I think the tool has to be. It's basically it's an industry tool that's dropped down for the types of investments that we make. So it won't be directly transferable as a tool in its own right but certainly happy to uh, engage further on sharing the, the learning. So, so therefore, what is transferable is your approach to developing the tool rather than the detail of the tool, which is very yeah. specific to your industry and your company. Yeah, I, I think that the, the key thing in any uh, organisation, any uh, company that's doing this, they have to have something that's aligned with what they do. Um, so it's, uh, you, uh, and one of the things that we found as an industry ourselves is that we were able to develop a, a carbon uh, emissions workbook for operational emissions that every company uses. Um, and it's a one-stop one shop. You go in there and you do the entire uh, inventory of your emissions. Um, for capital investment, uh, we could only produce the guidance because each water company had different ways of doing things. So it, you have to recognise the diversity of how, how organisations invest. Thank you. And we have a supplementary from Claudia Beamish. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And could I ask you, in relation to uh, Scottish Water's uh, business stream, how, how that works in terms of carbon accounting and um, whether that's something that uh, members of the public can see? Is there a website where they can see what, what the, how, how that um, process works? Um, with regards to our operational footprint, uh, one of the areas we don't cover is business stream because uh, what, I, what I report is our core and our regulated business uh, emissions, which would also include all the PFI companies that um, uh, operate some of our assets. So it's the core regulated business as part of our um, uh, uh, footprint. Um, I'm afraid I don't have direct access or, or, or input to the business stream side of, of things, but I can go and find out uh, where, where, that could be, where that could be found. Helpful, because I think it sends a clear message mm -hmm. to businesses that are working with yourselves um, mm -hmm. that, that um, mm -hmm. this is an important issue. Yeah. Uh, and one, one of the things we do to try and sort of help customers really as part of our carbon footprint uh, report annually is we, we, we let uh, customers know the carbon intensity of each of their water and wastewater services, so uh, any, uh, any, any customer could effectively get that information from our, our website. Right, thank you. Okay, I'd um, like to um, take in some questions for Sam Gardner now. Um, I'd possibly like to have your view on some of, maybe some of the things that Mark Williams has discussed with a view to information sharing to other sectors. 
Um, what, what, what can they learn maybe from what you've heard today? Um, well, I've, I suspect there's an awful lot they can learn. It sounds like Scottish Water are being particularly progressive and demonstrating some best practice. Um, and I think that's, that's commendable. Um, transparency and sharing of that is to be encouraged. I think um, one of the things that uh, became apparent in Mark's answers and uh, in the discussion is that uh, issues around uh, double counting and such and the need for kind of bespoke approaches to particular industries only serves to highlight the need for a cross economy approach that gives confidence that the sum total of all of these bits of investment add up to something that can be confidently um, prescribed as being consistent with tackling climate change. And um, that's where I think um, WWF certainly has had a concern over a number of years. Um, we've not been alone in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, this committee has previously kind of highlighted the challenge in being able to scrutinise the budget um, effectively and having confidence about how that capital investment delivers for climate change, as have other committees for some time. Um, so there's a, I could, <laughs> um, my answer could get quite long at this point is my point. So um, uh, there is a very welcome endeavour that was captured in the very first climate change bill um, that has been pursued with considerable kind of effort on the part of the Scottish Government to provide a carbon assessment of the budget. I think it's become apparent that over the course of the last nine years that that approach hasn't afforded committees with the means of understanding whether or not the finance budget will deliver for the climate change agenda. And there is a welcome opportunity that we and the Scottish Parliament, the committee has in front of it through a combination of both the budget review process, the forthcoming climate change bill and the climate change monitoring uh, plan that is coming, um, is coming forward in October and is required under the proposed climate change bill to be an annual report to bring these processes together in such a way that affords much greater understanding to the committee and to stakeholders as to whether or not capital investment is aligned with the climate change agenda. Um, WWF was instrumental in establishing something called the Low Carbon Infrastructure Commission, uh, Task Force, sorry, too many commissions, Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force, uh, which was made up of a broad range of different institutions um, from the Scottish Investment Bank, as it was then, to SCDI and Ramble, uh, Pinsent Masons, Edinburgh University and Oxfam and others that looked at how we could have low carbon investment into our capital spend. And one of their conclusions, um, which I think is pertinent to this point about how do we, how do we take that oversight as whether or not this, the sum total of our capital investment is fit for purpose, was the need for a low carbon infrastructure commission in Scotland, something that wouldn't be dissimilar from the National Infrastructure Commission at the UK level, that provides the means of uh, one, providing independent scrutiny as to whether or not the long-term investment plans of the Scottish Government are fit for a low-carbon, zero-carbon future. Um, and two, providing advice as to where that infrastructure need is most pressing. Where is the, uh, where is the gaps? Where is the infrastructure uh, investment most required? And how can that be aligned with delivering a, a zero-carbon future? Um, I think that idea has an awful lot of merit when we're talking about investment that happens today that will be basically we'll be living with in 2050 and trying to ensure that we have that long-term perspective applied to our capital investment um, decisions. Okay, thank you. Now we have some questions from Finlay Carson. Thank you very much. Uh, Sam, you, you've touched on the, the role of the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force. Can you tell us specifically what, you act, what your role was it and what did WWF contribute to it? Sure. Uh, so the idea came from WWF, born out of an understanding that uh, our capital investment will determine whether or not we meet our future long-term climate change targets. Um, we spend money today that will lock in behaviours and technologies that will shape whether or not we have emissions in 2050 or not. Um, so we sought to build an alliance of representatives from across the infrastructure cycle, whether that be from the legal space, from industry, from the finance sector, uh, from the development side. Um, and the the endeavour was in the first instance to try and take stock of what the, the current state of play was. And uh, we commissioned uh, Green Alliance at the time to do a piece of work that concluded by looking at the what proportion of the capital investment from the Scottish Government could be attributed to high, medium or low carbon. And it's, it's been welcomed that the, the Scottish Government kind of took up that approach and the Finance Secretary has 
continue to try and apply that um, in describing what the capital investment is at the moment. I think in doing so, it's become quite apparent that uh, the, you know, the figures um, given by the Scottish Government are that 29% of current capital investment could be described as low carbon, and the rest is a combination of neutral or high carbon. I think um, in the post-Paris Agreement world, those distinctions become a little bit uh, defunct in that we are moving towards a place for 2050 where it's, it's low carbon or it's no carbon. Um, we cannot be, we cannot have an investment cycle which 70% of which is contributing to climate change. Um, so we can see what the current balance of effort is and where it's going. Um, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Task Force then set about trying to identify what were the most pressing infrastructure needs that delivered multiple benefits for the Scottish economy, for the people of Scotland. Um, we peer reviewed those. We em employed Jacobs to do a, a fairly extensive piece of research interviewing lots of different sectors, including Scottish Water. Um, we then did a public poll, um, so we engaged the public to see, get a sense of where the, there was a public sense of need. Uh, key areas of investment that concluded from that project were energy efficiency, which is a topic that this committee and others have given some focus to, um, transforming our city centres into more livable spaces, which encourage and enable active travel and um, district heating support for and district heating networks, in particular connecting what we have at the moment, isolated district heating networks, and using the, uh, the investment spend of the Scottish Government to enable those networks to be built and connections to be made, because at the moment they happen increasingly in kind of isolated uh, one-off developments rather than being built strategically through some kind of long-term investment planning. So the, the whole project concluded with some uh, recommendations about the need for, as I've already alluded to, the, the value in a Scottish Infrastructure Commission and that oversight that it could provide. It described um, some key areas of low carbon investment that would um, go a long way to stimulating innovation um, and provide multiple wins for Scotland. And um, it shone a light, I think, on the importance of making sure that the investment spend that we have, the long term investment spend, delivers for the climate. comprehensive answer and, and you've answered my next question Sorry. which was what role did you actually play in the process of developing that but can, can you highlight once more the, the pros and cons of uh, the way the Scottish Government actually went about calculating the, the low neutral and high carbon uh, spend? Well I think um, to be fair the Scottish Government took the approach that at the time uh, we presented as the low carbon infrastructure task force it was a it's a very high level division um, it's uh, it seeks to kind of attribute the, the carbon associated with the capital investment to one of these three categories. I think what's really important now is that, um, particularly under, um, as we approach the scrutiny of a new climate change bill, which seeks to raise our carbon targets, our climate change targets, that um, we recognise that we cannot be locking in any carbon investment for the future. Um, what we can't be... Uh, uh, creating for ourselves is the need to return to infrastructure uh, 10 years down the line and expensively retrofit it with new technologies um, in order to enable us to meet future carbon targets. So um, we have to be locking in that transition to a zero carbon future and that requires a substantial shift in the proportion of investment that's spent on, on tackling on, on infrastructure that's not making a contribution to climate change. At the moment well over half of the investment is contributing to climate change, and roughly a third could be categorised as neutral, as, as low, sorry. And that, that's definitely got to change um, if we have any confidence that we're not making uh, the job an awful lot harder for us down the line and creating expensive challenges as we have to go back and retrofit. It's typically an awful lot more expensive to go back and retrofit a building um, than it is to kind of build it in from the first place. Thank you. From Richard Lyle. But first of all, I want to ask you some of the things you're saying about the, the low carbon infrastructure projects. That obviously, they have an impact, a fantastic impact on our emissions and our, all our climate change targets, but they also have uh, a big economic benefit as well. Do you think the narrative around that has to be spoken about more? You, know, you talk about things like active travel, energy efficiency, there's actually a big saving to be had. Um, Absolutely, and it's, you know, um, I think your question illustrates the fact that we still have a job to do to kind of articulate that broader set of benefits. Um, 
WWF is a member of the Existing Homes Alliance, which has gone to great lengths to illustrate the, the job creation figures associated with energy efficiency. So somewhere in the region of 9,000 jobs could be created by taking all of our homes to an EPC rating of C by 2025. Uh, they've also looked at what the savings would be to the NHS. Um, so similarly, others um, in the sustainable transport space have kind of invested a lot of time in articulating what the benefits would be to the NHS of improving our air quality, uh, what it would be to um, increasing the level of active travel. So absolutely, there's a, there's a really compelling need to kind of broaden the narrative beyond purely about delivering emissions reductions. These investments typically have multiple, multiple benefits associated with them, and we need to confidently prescribe them to those investments, yeah. Thank you. Richard. Uh, thank you, Kandina. Further to the question be Finlay, you say that Scotland's Way Ahead project recommended a creation of an independent Scottish Infrastructure Commission. Most organisations have a regulator. How important do you believe that an independent Scottish Infrastructure Commission would be, and is this you're asking any future bill? So, I think um, an awful lot would depend on how it was constituted, what its mandate was, what its resources are, and so on. But I think, um, it, given its, if it was to fulfil its greatest potential, I think it could have huge uh, significance in complementing the parliamentary scrutiny process and affording the Scottish Government with independent advice as to where the infrastructure needs are for Scotland going forward, and doing so in a way that it meant that there could be confidence that those infrastructure uh, commitments were compatible with delivering on the climate change agenda. At the moment, we don't have that. We have um, an infrastructure programme that's built up of the sum of its parts that come from across the Scottish Government, that come from the outside world, that people kind of put their hand up and make a case for, the sum total of which it's hard to kind of be confident or ascribe any confidence to is consistent with tackling climate change. Um, until we... Uh, allow ourselves to take that independent long-term perspective as to how we are building our future, I think there remains a risk that we will be making decisions that will contribute to, contribute to climate change and potentially lock us in. So it's, it's not about trying to replace a regulator or anything like that. It's trying to provide independent uh, objective analysis of what the infrastructure spend of the Scottish Government is, how it allies to climate change and where the where the most pressing needs are that need to be addressed and how could they be done in such a way that uh, maximizes the impact of public spend, uh, creates innovation, creates jobs, but at the same time uh, ensures that we tackle climate change. Thank you. And now to Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Um, so we have a new budget process um, and there's an opportunity uh, perhaps to consider climate change more in more detail. Um, do you have particular views on how the Scottish Government could improve the way it monitors and reports on the climate impact of the capital programme? Um, yes, indeed. Um, so, WWF worked with Strathclyde's International Public Policy Institute to look at just this challenge. Um, the first thing I want to say is that we have had an attempt on the part of the Scottish Government uh, year on year to present an understanding of a kind of picture of what the climate impacts are of the budget. Um, I think it's become accepted that that goes as far as it does, but it doesn't provide us with, it certainly doesn't provide, I would suggest, the committee with the means of understanding whether that spend will contribute to tackling climate change or locks us into kind of high carbon behaviours. So the forthcoming climate change bill, along with the climate change monitoring framework, provides us with an opportunity to, to align these two processes that to date have been entirely separate, but are then been sought to bring together in a rather artificial way, and I think rather unsatisfactorily, uh, despite everyone's best efforts. Um, so um, the carbon assessment as we currently get it is a snapshot in time of the carbon emissions associated with that spend. It doesn't provide us with a kind of cumulative sense of what the consequences are of that spend. Um, perhaps most importantly of all, it doesn't obviously interact with the budget process. It's a uh, after the fact description of what the consequences are of those budget decisions rather than a tool that's used to inform and reflect and integrate with the, the budget development process. I think um, the, the opportunity that the new budget scrutiny uh, process affords is for the Scottish Government um, to present the Scottish Parliament with material in October um, through the new uh, climate change monitoring plan that will support the climate change plan. Um, that should set out 
as this, pre as this committee has asked for in previous sessions, a description of what the high level expenditure is associated with the, the policies that gives you the raw material to understand whether or not when the budget comes in front of you is do these two things match up? What's always been the case up until now is that the committee has been provided with level four figures sometime, sometime after the budget has been produced that has really challenged your and the outside world's ability to understand whether or not the budget will deliver against the climate change plan. Um, Previous climate change plans, as they were known, reports and proposals and policies provided a description of what the total kind of cost was associated with a, with a policy stream. Um, the current climate change plan doesn't do that, which I think makes it all the more important that the climate change monitoring plan provides a greater level of transparency to afford the committee members and others uh, sufficient understanding to know what's required in order to make a policy a success. I think the the behind every policy in the climate change monitoring plan is a theory of change. And sometimes that theory of change is as simple as Scottish government invests X and gets Y. But if you don't know what X needs to be and Y is not described very clearly or is some many steps removed, it's going to be increasingly hard for the committee, I think, to take a view as to whether or not the spend that's attributed in the budget that you get in the new year matches with that, with that policy. So, we, in the, we have the opportunity through the monitoring plan and what comes forward to the committee in October um, to really get a level of information that hasn't previously been afforded, to reflect on that, and in that in turn can inform the committee's submissions uh, back to the Scottish Government as to how the budget should take account of climate change. Um, can I just follow up on that? I mean, you talked about the budget and the assessments of budgets about very much being a snapshot. Mm. Um, uh, is there a, a difficulty here for governments in that, uh, you know, in many ways, capital programs are multi-year, they can be quite lumpy, so you might have a, a, a large degree of high, cap um, high carbon capital spend one year and then it could go down again next year once we've built the bridge or, or whatever. So how do, we, how do we assess the kind of trajectory that government's on um, without sort of plucking a 12-month figure and saying, well, that was a great year or that was a bad year? Yeah. So... I think that's what we currently do. I think we, we have the year that the, the carbon assessment comes out and that describes the consequences of that year. I think what the, uh, the work that the International Institute for Public Policy um, from Strathclyde uh, described is an attempt to, how, do we, how would we provide a forecast? Um, so rather than how would we describe the instantaneous impact of a budget spend, how do we provide a longer term forecast? And they set out and we kind of, attach it in our evidence, two approaches. One would be a more top-down approach, which um, would seek to attribute a kind of carbon consequence to revenue spend um, built over research and analysis as what's, what's the projected saving associated with this. And yes, it would be refined over time and it wouldn't be incredibly accurate, but it would give you confidence about the direction of travel. But then for the more substantive uh, high carbon or capital investment projects of which there is huge amounts of data associated with them, particularly transport projects, it's much more possible to do a bottom-up analysis for those specific projects and says, yes, over the lifetime of this project, this is, this is what the carbon implications will be. So I think, whilst it's no doubt challenging, I think we all recognise that the, um, the approach that the bill, the 2009 Climate Change Act, affords us has had its limitations. The forthcoming bill that um, comes to this committee uh, provides an opportunity to strengthen that and in doing so require um, futurist carbon assessments to provide that forecast and I think these, these briefings outline two kind of approaches that would help do that. We have some questions from other members of the committee. First Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you convener. Um, would it be fair to say that if the government's carbon expenditure rose that would be a good thing if, in consequence, it's displacing expenditure elsewhere in the system. In other words, just to go back to my cement example, if we found a way of using a new material yep. that had a, a lower carbon footprint but not zero, and the government themselves went and dug out the mud which we're using instead of cement, I'm stretching the bounds of probability here, um, we're no longer 
incurring the cement cost in the overall system, but we're increasing the carbon cost in the government system. And isn't that one of the, sort of the generality of what I'm saying, isn't that one of the difficulties in understanding what are, quote, good outcomes? Because the outcomes are not simply outcomes for the government, but for the whole system. Yeah. So your point is a good one, and it illustrates the challenge of where you draw the boundary around the, the implications of expenditure. And I think um, what I would be encouraging in uh, any future carbon assessments that are provided by the Scottish Government in light of um, the challenges that uh, we've all experienced in trying to understand the current situation is to draw that net wider, not to attribute it to, um, let me start again, to attribute the carbon consequences to that spend to the whole of Scotland. So what happens as a consequence of capital investment spend in terms of shifting behaviours, encouraging, for instance, a displacement of road traffic onto rail, say we dueled the, the railway line north of Perth, um, what would the carbon consequences of that be, which go well beyond the, you know, that might actually be a high carbon investment in the point of laying of steel. Um, but, you know, that's an investment that over the life cycle of it ought to kind of uh, support a shift in, in transport behaviour. Similarly, if we're investing in a greater network of cycle paths, um, Obviously, that's a, that's a carbon investment that has to be laying tarmac and such. But, you know, a life cycle assessment of that should show that it displaces and encourages um, active travel. So I think it's necessary for the net to be thrown quite wide in capturing the implications of what the Scottish Government's capital investment spend is because that capital investment has a purpose and that purpose is a public policy and it needs to be seen in the round. And when you do that, I think you're then able to capture the longer term benefits that are prescribed to that expenditure. That's all questions answered from the, the, the committee. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're going to suspend the session for a couple of minutes.
In uh, resuming our evidence in the Scottish Government's budget, I now welcome Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work. He is joined by his officials, Dr Simon Fuller, the Deputy Director of Economic Analysis, Rachel Guion, Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Investment, and Claire Hamilton, Deputy Director of Decarbonisation Dis Division of the Scottish Government. Welcome to everyone. And we have some questions from our members. The first from John Scott. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I ask you what role do you have in making the Scottish Government's capital budget proposals work together with climate and environmental targets, particularly under the new year-round budget cycle? I thank you uh, for the question and, and good morning to the committee. Uh, I see my role as part of the essentially overall government corporate organisation delivering on our targets, both statutory and what we have set out by way of policy. Uh, we have published the a national performance framework um, as well that sets out uh, the objectives of the country, our purpose, and within all of that, I work with uh, cabinet secretaries and ministers to deliver on our. A, a commitments and ambitions, not least on our um, a carbon commitments and the climate change plan. So, principally, understanding <clears throat> the policy objective and then working with cabinet secretaries to ensure that there is necessary investment. So, it's certainly a collective approach uh, with individual cabinet secretaries, um, and I bring together the, the fiscal function of the government naturally. Thank you. Could you give us a more, more detail on how the cabinet secretaries actually work together to, I mean, when you're allocating the capital budget and you're thinking about decarbonisation or emissions, um, what role do the cabinet secretaries for the environment, climate change, land form and, for example, transport work together in order to, to realise that vision? Uh, so when we look at capital particularly and infrastructure, I work very closely with the Infrastructure Secretary. Clearly, that role has um, uh, changed. Uh, Michael Matheson now holds uh, that role. So, Infrastructure Secretary, uh, including Keith Brown and now um, Michael Matheson, I'd work more closely on the capital plan, um, recognising their role in infrastructure spend. But all Cabinet Secretaries have an interest in terms of their portfolio and the allocation that they would get in terms of their uh, capital spend, specifically to the question around um, a environment or rural economy. There would be bilateral meetings. There would be uh, that engagement through the budget process, working towards the budget to deliver um, their specific objectives. Uh, but one committee that I found very useful on this particular agenda is the uh, Cabinet Subcommittee. Um, which has met to focus specifically on uh, climate change and emissions, and that, of course, has fed into the climate um, change plan. So that's separate from the annual budget round, because that's specifically on that plan, but annually for the budget, I'd engage with all cabinet secretaries, specifically those in terms of uh, climate change. And as they say, the uh, infrastructure um, Secretary essentially has had a role in the allocation of capital spending as well. And of course, the, uh, I suppose the purpose of inviting me uh, today is to explore how in this new budget process we look at what's different from what before. Um, whether there's no change within government process to the budget, what the uh, budget process review group has tried to do is give the parliament deeper engagement into the pre-budget um, period, and I suppose that's where this dialogue is useful, and I'm happy to explore that uh, as much uh, as, as you are. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Kimura. Um Could you perhaps, uh, Cabinet Secretary, give us an example of a change to a plan that is derived from the carbon impact of what a proposal might have been? Um, I think you would have to take that back to policy. What, what are we trying to achieve as a government and then how does that feed into actual spend? Um, so I suppose uh, a substantial area would be, say, 
electrification of the trains, the transport networks. So we know it's a policy. Um, we know it's an aspiration in terms of um, more sustainable forms of travel, and there has been substantial investment into rail specifically. And that's understanding uh, the impact of um, vehicles on the roads. So we make a policy choice. We want to continue investing into uh, rail. So it's a policy choice, and then it's manifested in massive spend on both railways generally and electrification of the rail. So that, that's, a, a, of course, a huge um, example um, of that. There'd be many sp many areas of spend within the estate. For example, we're trying to make buildings more energy efficient. For example, and that's understanding the emissions coming from our estate, the buildings, and how we take that forward. So, from massive policy to just better practice from existing resource. So, so therefore, the success of the carbon approach the government's taking lies in that becoming a part of the assessment at the earliest possible stage of any decision. And therefore, by the time it reaches the Minister for a decision, these issues have been dealt with and, and matters are coming forward in that way. So, that, so, so, so you're really saying the whole carbon assessment is embedded in the system right from the very first time that the matter is considered? Well, I would say so in the very thinking of ministers and government policy right through to individual decisions on actual spend. You would think about the uh, impacts uh, from the, the policies that, that we're making, and as I say, that would that that is now driven by the climate change plan, which is you know, setting out our ambitions for a country. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning, cabinet secretary. Uh, could I ask you um, if we could turn our, our discussion to the infrastructure investment plan? And as, as you'll know, the Scottish Government's response to our committee's last budget report committed to the next plan, um, taking into account uh, Scotland's climate <coughs> targets. Are there plans for a refreshed IPP? And how, how will it take the proposed stronger climate change targets uh, into account? So I think that the, the current thinking around infrastructure investment is quite clearly um, influenced by these high-level commitments we have around climate change. Incidentally, not least the commitment that was secured at the last budget in terms of capital spend and the proportion um, a, of, of, of a low carbon spend a, there. Um, so there are ongoing decisions around that infrastructure investment. Uh, the IIP is a, is a high-level document. I think that considering some of the recent announcements around infrastructure spend, uh, as outlined in the programme for government, um, there will be a need to look uh, at um, further iterations of that. Of course, it was last published in 2015. Um, but I also need to be careful I shouldn't make unilateral decisions today at committee because the infrastructure secretary might have something to say about that who has a lead responsibility for the plan. Of course, I would set out uh, the uh, finances and the considerations uh, therein. But I think it's fair to say that having published the document, there's been um, uh, iterations throughout because of the nature of infrastructure spend. But I think we would be looking at its uh, revision. We'll turn our mind to that. And when we do that, to answer the question quite clearly, of course, the ambitions in the climate change plan and the direction of travel uh, uh, towards that uh, low carbon economy will have to feature in such a revision. I'll come back to Claudia, but Mark Russell has a supplementary question for, for that. Yes, th thanks, Convener. I mean, Cabinet Secretary, you made a, a welcome commitment as part of this year's budget process to increase the amount of low carbon capital spend throughout the lifetime of this Parliament. I'm just wondering if that is consistent with what is in the IIP, because We've been looking at some analysis which suggests that in the short term, from year to year, the proportion of low carbon is increasing. But if we look at the whole IIP within the round, there's perhaps some suggestion that it may be increasing over time. So how do you, what was your response to this? And I think um, I was watching some of the earlier evidence. So I, I, I witnessed the, the point around the difficulty in taking it year from year compared to overall. I think um, 
I think it was yourself that, that, that made the point around you might have a good year or a bad year, but direction of travel is really important. The commitment I've made, of course, was for the annual budget, but that wasn't just a one-off, that's the direction of travel that we want to continue. Um, so I suppose when we're looking at the longer term on infrastructure, we want that direction of travel to continue and um, to ensure that we keep within that in the longer term. So that commitment for the budget, proportion of low carbon spend, year on year means from here on in as best we can. So I suppose we'll be able to look at the totality uh, when we have the next full um, infrastructure plan. But I think it is important, at least if we're doing it year on year, then surely the long term trend within that um, would be the right direction of travel. Just to be clear then, are you saying that the commitment that you made as part of the budget process is consistent completely with the IIP or that the IIP will need to be reviewed? So the IIP gives us the headlines of commitments. The budget year to year is exactly what we're funding, so exactly what those capital commitments are. So we want to deliver what's in IIP, but of course there's that need to revise it in light of financial commitments and other developments, keep within the ambitions for the low carbon economy, but importantly what's spent on capital each year is where I try and achieve that commitment, because that's the most meaningful place I can do that, if that's clearer. Okay. Claudia. Thank you. Uh, could, could I ask you in a bit more detail, Cabinet Secretary, to uh, tell us about the IPP and how, the, how does this relate to the Infrastructure Investment Board? Does, do you expect this board to give you advice that takes climate change into account for the IPP or indeed for the budget process as we go forward, which was highlighted by Dr Gardner and, and also my colleague uh, Mark Ruskell. Um, could, could you say anything more about that? Again, I need to be careful. I'm not encroaching. Although yeah. we're you know, a team approach in the Scottish Government, I'm not making decisions on behalf of other Cabinet Secretaries directly. I know some committee members are eager that I do do that. <laughs> I'm eager that uh, uh, am I? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I just make the point that I don't lead that process and I don't want to mislead the committee in that regard. So I, I was specifically asked what advice I would get. So uh, the, the, the infrastructure board uh, within the Scottish Government looks at a, a range of issues, including the um, strategic approach, the, the finances, the contribution to sustainable economic growth and all of that. And yes, I would expect it to be taken, um, a, 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 all the environmental issues into account as well as it advise on the delivery of uh, our infrastructure uh, commitments and the options um, going forward. Um, again, to be clear, uh, with the major commitments around infrastructure spend, we do need to look again at the long-term infrastructure commitments. And all the thinking that's been developed over the last number of years will have to feature in those spending decisions, uh, which have not yet uh, been set out, but for my part, when it comes to the annual budget, we are absolutely looking at uh, the environmental contribution in every spending decision that we make in relation to that um, carbon and capital um, a, a, a profile. Would you see the, um, the monitoring commitment that's been made by um, our, the Cabinet Secretary for Environment and Climate Change, um, uh, Rosanna Cunningham, as, as something that will, will help with the, the budget process, as that, I think that commitment's made that that will come in October, because our concern, as highlighted by Mark Ruskell, and you will have heard earlier, is that there's an ongoing um, assessment and, and that that fits into the budget. It's been very difficult for us as a committee to analyse the budget previously because it's been sort of things have appeared simultaneously and we're looking at it, you know, at level four and thinking, well, what can we do now, you know? <laughs> Whereas it's beforehand, perhaps, and ongoing that's important. So I think timescales is the issue here. Um, the, the, of course, to understand the reason why the Scottish budget is in the timescales that have been set out is it really has to follow on from the UK government's budget for a range of reasons, the fiscal framework and the, uh, all the decisions that are taken there and how they impact on the Scottish budget. So I can't go any earlier than that, and I've tried to, to deliver a Scottish budget within three weeks of the UK budget. Interestingly, I also have been advised previously by Treasury I'll get 10 weeks' notice of the UK budget 
time scale. Not any content, just the time scale. I get a courtesy call the night before, but some of the content's headline. Um, that's very interesting because the clock's ticking right now on that 10 week time scale if that holds. Um, so if, if there's monitoring information earlier than that, it may well be able to inform the committee and yes, ministers as to um, a, a progress, but I still don't present any draft information. This is a process point of interest to any draft budget earlier than that because the first presentation I make of the budget is on Scottish Budget Day when I present it. So I think there is a slight, for your purposes, mismatch between the monitoring you receive and then how you're trying to influence the budget that you haven't seen. But equally, I can't publish it in earlier for the reasons that I've given. I can't publish a draft draft budget. And I suppose that's where we're trying to explore this process with you. What are the kind of things you would want us to be considering in advance of the Scottish Government determining the budget, as opposed to simply you scrutinising what we've proposed after? And I'm afraid that's in your hands, not in mine. But I totally appreciate the point around monitoring and information. I still can't present the budget any earlier than I do uh, because um, it wouldn't be a credible budget because of the timescales fo following uh, on um, from, from the UK timescales. Uh, but, 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 but does that information, can it help us? Yes, I think it can. Yes, I think but, but, but without preempting what we might say as a committee, one of the things that came up this morning was the fact that um, in terms of infrastructure projects, there's at the moment about, 20, I think it's 29% that are actually low carbon. And one might consider, uh, if we're not going to lock in, as, as Dr Gardner says, to having to retrofit uh, projects later, that those could be more, perhaps more overarching assessments which could be made uh, in the lead up to the budget, possibly. So I mean, I, 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 no, it's a helpful su suggestion. I think, uh, to answer the point, it can help and inform. It just, but you were concerned about the time scales you have to review everything. Yes. The assessments come out at the same mm -hmm. time as the budget because it's informing what we think the budget achieves at that point. Yeah. And at that point, it is a settled budget. And I'm sure you appreciate, all members of the committee will appreciate, that concluding the Scottish budget within three weeks having taken into account the Fiscal Commission and everything else um, it is, is heroic in itself, but that means all the assessments have to come at the same time because once we've cemented and determined the budget, we're then presenting the uh, carbon assessments. Mm -hmm. A heroic task for everybody. Um, could, could, could I just turn our thoughts as my, as my final uh, contribution to the National Performance Framework and ask you... Um, how you see the Infrastructure Investment Board, um, which proposes to measure its effectiveness by relevant national outcomes and related indicators. Um, and would you see the Reduce Scotland's carbon footprint, obviously, as one of the relevant indicators of success? And what involvement do you have in, in that process? Um, I, I, well, yes, in essence, I, I do. The performance framework should guide everything, government, our agencies, uh, partners, uh, you know, and, and as was our aspiration, that wider society does as well. So the purpose, objectives and monitoring within that should influence all of those considerations and recommendations coming forward. So, yes, that should be taken into account. I've had overall responsibility uh, for... Um, refreshing and delivering the national performance framework so I have a keen interest to make sure that it's both resourced uh, and uh, delivered adequately but of course cabinet and first minister has launched this and signed it off as well but every part of government should be contributing towards its objectives um, to ensure that we meet those so yes it should feature in the considerations of of all parts of government including right through the civil service as as described by uh, Ms Beamish. In your um role as Cabinet Secretary for Finance, would you um, see that you have the opportunity perhaps or, or indeed the obligation to, um, to look at whether those um, outcomes and indicators are being honoured and what would happen if you thought that they weren't? Because it is a real <laughs> concern, you know, and it, it may be a, a point of, of possibility for shifting from 29% to a lot more of low carbon infrastructure. Well, we, we take collective responsibility in any event, so all of Cabinet, all Ministers should be thinking about contributing towards it. And if there were areas where we weren't achieving, then there's a collective engagement to resolve that. 
um, notwithstanding, as I say, we have the performance framework, but of course we'll have the statutory duties under the climate change plan as well. So again, every part of Cabinet is expected to contribute towards that because ultimately um, we arrived at the plan through a process of Cabinet discussion as well through the Cabinet subcommittee uh, and bilaterals. Okay, before I turn to other members of the panel, I was, I was going to ask you sort of the same question that I asked Sam Gardner. When we're looking at um, low carbon initiatives or infrastructure spend, preventative spend, how much of a, a, a long term view do you take as a, in your role as to the savings that there could be around this? That, you know, the, the, the long term view of these projects actually allowing us to have. Uh, more money at our disposal as, as a result of some of these projects now? I think, I think it's wise investments now. I, my ministerial career has involved local government and planning and transport and finance and the economy. So I've had a lot of exposure to a lot of the issues that, that really matter in that regard. And I, I, I could, I'm sure you don't want me to ream off the, the areas in which we've spent, I think, very conscientiously. A, not just for the immediate benefits, but for the benefits of future generations, whether that is in the environment or whether that is in transport or doubling the active travel budget or the decarbonisation of transport, forestry, a, energy efficiency. Uh, and we know we've got more to do around a, land use and agriculture, to, to, to pick on a couple of other examples there. But I think it's clear that through a lot of the decisions we've taken, there are long-term benefits of that. And I was listening to some of the uh, examples given earlier about sometimes the, there might be a, a carbon output from the spend at that point in time, but the long-term benefits, the generational benefits are worth it. Uh, but we're absolutely committed to this direction of travel, and that's why we've been uh, increasing thing, uh, areas of spend such as active travel, sustainable um, transport, the electrification um, uh, agenda, more charging points, uh, for example. And then specifically, I think some of the community elements, so the Climate Challenge Fund, for example, has distributed over £100 million, many beneficiaries of those projects as well. So it's as much about raising awareness, uh, behaviour change, as it is actual physical spend on the capital infrastructure of our country. And in everything we do, it's not always captured, but higher standards, whether that's building standards or how materials are used, is, is shown, I think, in a, an environmental awareness that maybe wasn't there you know, years ago, but is absolutely mainstreamed in policy spend and standards now. I don't know if that helps. It does. Thank you. Um, and now to Finlay Carson. Morning. Um, the Climate Change Delivery Board formerly known as the, the Emissions Reduction Programme Board, uh, oversees the, the delivery of statutory emissions uh, targets. Now, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, in your specific role, do you receive any advice from uh, the, the Climate Change Delivery Board? I wouldn't have done. My information comes generally, well, has come more recently through the Climate a change cabinet subcommittee which looked at all the detail what portfolios were expected to do uh, and all the commitments and policies within that so that's where um, the advice that I would have been receiving and then contributing to has come from I should add though that the work building up to the climate change um, plan um, has meant that I think there's the, the requirement to establish a new governance body uh, to deliver um, the uh, well, the, the delivery of the climate change plan. So I think, again, this is more um, my en environment, uh, colleagues, in terms of Cabinet Secretary, um, to look at how that is structured going forward. But, but my work would have come through the Cabinet subcommittee. That's where my briefings would have come from and what I would have been contributing to. OK. Uh, as, as we know, Scotland is some of the most unique and fragile environments. And as such, we, we have a strategic environmental uh, assessments are undertaken when plans are likely to have significant environmental impact. Uh, but financial plans are excluded from those assessments uh, and there's no requirements to have environment assessments uh, on, on uh, the uh, infrastructure investment plan. Would you see a, a value in a voluntary approach to, to these strategic environmental assessments uh, to any new infrastructure plans? 
I think overall it makes more sense to deliver them project by project because then you're, you know what you're dealing with, you know what the project is, you know what the spend is, you know the geography, and, it's a, and I think it's a far more credible process. If we start to do it for plans, I think it's a bit more nebulous, a bit more, a bit more difficult to, to, to judge and properly quantify. So if you, take, if you say take the whole IIP, you don't necessarily have the detailed timescales, the geography, all, all the information at hand. It'd be a very bureaucratic and expensive exercise if we're doing it properly, and it still might not give you the, the information you really wanted. So I think project by project um, I, gives you a more robust um, set of figures. I, don't take my word for it. If you would like an economist in the government, explain how nebulous, not that all advice is always absolutely clear for me, I have to say, but if, if, if you want further advice from an official on why project by project is more meaningful than um, assessing overarching plans, then I'm sure Simon Fuller could add to that, to convener, if that's permissible. Yep, no, no, I, just to add what the Cabinet Secretary said, I think the challenge sometimes doing these assessments for the infrastructure investment plan as a whole is just the sheer scale of it. So in order to do the environment assessment rigorously, the, what you'll have to look at will vary hugely depending on what type of infrastructure is being considered, the geography in which infrastructure is being invested in, and so on. And so I think there's a risk that by trying to do this strategic environmental assessment for the plan as a whole, you're going to in, almost inevitably have it at a higher level and maybe not quite superficially but maybe just you know at a higher level of aggregation and perhaps looking at individual plans and programs on the ground which then give you arguably a much more robust and much more meaningful assessment of what the impact will be for individual projects okay thank you Finley happy with that I, um, can my yes. um, notwithstanding what you say I mean there is a need for high-level appreciation in terms of a direction of travel, in terms of your overall investment. And I appreciate what you're saying about the aggregation, but nonetheless, the aggregation of the total must ultimately lead to an overall picture, which provides a direction of travel, which, which we're going to come on to in further questions. Um, but I think that is concerning the committee. Um, the, the high carbon investment future. Others will come on to that. But just, just wanted to get that out, or maybe you want to comment on that at the moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I share the uh, view that we need that understanding, but the specific question I was asked, should we adopt a strategic impact assessment for the plan? We don't think that that's the best tool. Do we need a national understanding of direction of travel and emissions and input and um, proportion of spend? Yes, but that's a slightly different question. I share the, the objective. That's a slightly different question to uh, the very specifics of a process of an S, uh, a strategic uh, impact assessment on an overall plan. That's quite a different tool. So I'm just, I agree with the ambition here, but the tool I think is, as we've tried to explain, not the right one. Okay. okay, we're moving on to talking about the programme for government, and Mark Ruskell has some questions around that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, obviously, last week's announcement um, you know, announced higher capital spend. There was a focus in the headlines on low carbon spend. W will that uh, impact on the balance between high and low carbon capital going forward? And how will that then influence the IIP? So will the programme for government then you know, effectively force a, a revision of the IIP? Again, I think it's a very fair question, and it's the question, I suppose, that the seven billion headline figure that we've committed to, is that captured within these aspirations? In essence, we, so what we've done is we've set out that headline commitment, um, recognising you know, the proportion of GDP that, that's um, spent on infrastructure. Um, we'll be returning to Parliament, I think, um, uh, I, I'm sure we said within a, a few months um, was the commitment that Mr Matheson gave uh, to return uh, to Parliament. Clearly I'll have an interest for the budget as well. Um, the, and as I tried to touch on earlier on in uh, my answer, um, further iterations of the um, infrastructure investment plan will be required. So I think that the, the policy direction, the climate change plan, the uh, commitments around proportion of spend 
will all have to be taken into account. But as I say, that a £7 billion commitment at a very early stage, it's important to, to set the ambition, the mission out there um, that we're trying to deliver. But of course, it would fit within our ambitions for transition to a low carbon economy. The detail is, uh, of course, uh, to come in due course. So, I mean, programme for government, obviously one year, um, very ambitious announcement this year with, with increase in capital. Um, how do you take account of the need for change over multiple years? And this perhaps relates to the IIP again. Perhaps if I could focus you on one example which came up in, uh, in the budget this year, and that's rail reinstatement projects. Um, there is a local rail development fund. A number of communities have bid into that. They're getting you know, success there in terms of... Um, applying for money to do feasibility work on rail reinstatements. However, if those uh, projects are successful and there's good business cases made for uh, capital projects going forward, obviously uh, that's going to place a demand on government to see these projects through to completion and to reopen these, these rail routes and stations across Scotland. So how do you, how do you factor that into the, to the pipeline? We've got a policy which is raising expectation, which is doing good feasibility work now around Scotland to bring communities back into the rail network, but we're still some way away from realising that low carbon capital investment. So how does that work then in relation to IIP and individual annual budgets? Uh, is it about an annual negotiation within this parliament around capital spend, or is there a longer term commitment that government, government can make to these longer term, uh, more embedded infrastructure changes over time? Again, without trying to step on the infrastructure secretary's toes, um, naturally, <laughs> well, from my point of view, finance secretary, um, there are many areas where there's multi-year commitments right now, and that does include transport, uh, housing, and digital, so naturally there will have to be a long-term approach uh, uh, to this. And I should say that an overarching objective of the new infrastructure investment will be sustainable economic growth, and an emphasis on that um, uh, throughout. So I think we, will, of course, will look at the, the weighting and the assessment of what projects uh, feature, but it will be within that uh, policy objective of, of low carbon. I actually think rail is a really good example because we know that it is a success story. It contributes uh, in a positive way in terms of the economy and the environment and um, uh, connectivity as well and infrastructure, and it can also tackle um, exclusion either individually or, or geographically as well. So um, the government's got a strong, proud record on, on real investment and we'll want that to continue. And for me, that's been maximising resources from UK government as well um, to try and ensure that we get our fair share of real resources. And that has been a battle over the last year um, um, and to continue doing that with our own spend it will be um, critical. So we will take a long-term approach. As I say, I'm, I'm trying to express it with the massive uh, headline commitment around infrastructure spend that there will have to be further iterations of the IIP. And we have moved on in policy terms on what features within that. And as I say, it's I mean, let, let's face it, it's a substantial commitment that we made in last year's budget process on the direction of travel and the trajectory for capital spend uh, around low carbon. And it's one that we want to uh, continue. Yeah, I mean, I have a, a further question on that. The long-term view is really important when it comes to those infrastructure um, projects, particularly rail. But the way that they are assessed sometimes can be looking at the current population, the current passenger numbers, but not actually looking term, long term, but maybe repopulating an area or expand, expanding a population. I mean, is that something that you look into when you're looking at these, these projects? Well, it's the, and there's stagger appraisals and various appraisals that, that can show the difference that one form of transport can make over another form of transport and um, the investment that's required and what the return on that is. But yes, it looks at the potential, how it could lock economic opportunities. If you look at Borders Rail, for example, it's, uh, the, the, the benefits of it have been profound and it's, it's incredibly um, popular and it's surpassed our targets. So I think that's a good example of where it's it's made a, a geography more accessible, um, but it's delivered uh, economic benefits in its own right. Um, so I think they, they can all be part of the, the considerations. Uh, some real considerations, of course, might just be that there's other forms of transport, but not rail, and rail could allow that shift from one form of transport into a more 
um, environmentally friendly form of transport. Thank you. Right, we're moving on to talking about local authorities, and Richard Lyle has some questions. Yes, thank you. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in the space analysis of local authority capital expenditure plans, categorised by climate impact, the top six on climate impact are Falkirk, North Lanarkshire, Glasgow, Perth and Kinross, Eastern Bartonshire, and somewhere you know, Renfrewshire. They have the highest proportion of investment categorised as high carbon. In all cases, this is the result of proportionally high levels of investment categorised as road or airport investment. Using the government's methodology, how would the Scottish Government engage with local authorities to discuss their approaches to the climate impact of their capital budgets? Uh, that is a very curious question from a former councillor, of course, uh, Mr Lyle. Incidentally, I know these other places as well as Renfrewshire. I, don't, <laughs> I get out a bit <laughs> as well. Um, the, the essence of, of, of the question is we, we do not have a monitoring regime over and above uh, local governments' uh, own monitoring of their capital spend in relation to emissions. It is not the nature of the relationship. We do not instruct them how to, to spend. Therefore, we do not have our own processes. Uh, to, to hold them to account for their emissions as part of their capital grant from the Scottish Government. If the committee feels we should do something different, I have to say that would be a departure from what Parliament usually asks us for in relation to fiscal freedom of local authorities, but we do not um, pursue them in the kind of fashion that was suggested in the question. You touched on it slightly earlier, and I know it transcends into um, uh, uh, over into another area, but what would you be asking councils to do, like to reduce climate impact in, in any projects? Could you be asking them, for instance, as I have been pushing in this parliament for quite a number of months now, uh, I welcome the government's um, uh, movement on it, installing electric car charging points in new house building. We now have solar panels on roofs. Why don't new, when we're building new houses from now? Uh, insist that everyone, including private and public um, uh, house builders, install car charging points because we can't just install them in the street if all the cars in the street can't plug in at the same time. Why don't we have a plug in in our own home? Yeah, I, again, I appreciate the point. There are many areas where we do compel um, local government to meet certain standards. I think planning is a good example, or where there's national planning policy, or the national planning framework is a spatial strategy, or building standards. So the, there's, there's regulatory compliance. So I, there are environmental standards. Uh, there is a leadership onus upon local government as well. But Parliament has previously debated the, the principle of um, how closely we should hold local government to account for emissions. So whilst there's an expectation to show leadership, uh, compliance, to abide with all the standards that are set out, and, and that has been um, progressing, I just say in relation to the fiscal point, uh, in terms of the resource they have from the Scottish Government on capital, we don't compel them to spend any amount on uh, for capital a specific purpose. That said, of course, we're investing on... Um, Housing, for example, which is a substantial investment by the Scottish Government to local authorities, that it meets all current standards. So it speaks to the point that Mr Lyle was making around expectations on policy, but that's set through standards as opposed to holding local government to account for their individual capital spend, which is for those local authorities and their democratic systems and audit, as opposed to government holding them to account. That's, that's not what we've insisted upon. Policy change, again, if I'm, if I'm not being clear here, policy change can be delivered through national policy, but I'm answering for the finances. Just if you allow me, convener, I'm not suggesting that we stick it to councils. Uh, I, as you say, I was a councillor, and I, and, I, and I would abhor that. Um, so, but what I am saying, so, or suggesting, should we not ha be having a discussion on how they can reduce their carbon footprint? Those discussions do happen. I'm sure the planning minister would speak to that. I'm sure the environment secretary would speak to that. There's, there's many bilaterals. There's much engagement with COSLA and local governments on their actions to reduce emissions. I'm just speaking for the financial element and the capital spend, which I understood to be the theme of the day. So I'm just being very clear with the distinction. I'm not objecting to using policy to make progress, but we don't 
hold local government to account for the, ca for the specific capital investment they make by way of instructing them how they should spend it? Bring it back to the Scottish budget. Um, Angus Macdonald has got some questions around that. You know, if I could uh, briefly touch on, on options to improve future Scottish budget information uh, and climate assessments. Now, um, the Scottish Government's response to this committee's last budget report committed to providing the committee with annual uh, information on the proportion of the overall capital budget allocated to low carbon projects uh, and programmes. So perhaps you could give us a bit more clarity with regard to when in the budget cycle uh, do you expect that um, information will be available? As soon after the um, budget as I could possibly provide it. Um, naturally, in working to the budget, uh, and that would be budget close, incidentally, not even draft budget. Parliament is well aware. Minority government requires negotiation. Um, uh, and I engage with other parties, so the start of the budget uh, can change to the end of the budget. So on conclusion of the budget uh, is when I can publish the, uh, essentially um, that information, that, that high-level information. And I do appreciate it as a high-level exercise um, that we undertake, and I am interested in the committee's views around uh, the detail of that and what would be helpful. But in terms of timescales, it's as soon after the budget as it is agreed, and I can then publish it. Naturally, I'll be trying to understand those figures as I work our way through the budget to keep to the commitment that's been given, but sharing with you is post-budget. Okay, thanks. Um, clearly, we look forward to, to receiving it as soon as you can uh, share it. Um, last year was the, the first time the government published information categori categorising its in-year capital spend as low, neutral and high carbon. Um, are you open to improvements in, in the methodology, for example, breaking down the larger areas of spend like housing, roads, rail and health to provide more detailed information? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'd be a, quite a foolish uh, Cabinet Secretary to come to committee and say I'm not open to improvements. <laughs> of, course, of course I am and I, I know what the committee will be driving at here. So. Um, I am open to improvements in that regard. It was a process that um, was ag agreed <coughs> to try and understand uh, the uh, level of spend and the direction of travel. I think it's helpfully achieved that purpose, but I'm open to improvements to that. I'd welcome uh, improvements to okay. the methodology. Um, thank you very much, convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, do you have any concerns about the effects on jobs uh, by endeavouring to move to a low carbon economy? How do you, have you made any assessment of that? That would be considered in terms of the climate change plan. I, of course, would say jobs can be created in a transition to a low carbon uh, economy as well. Um, and I think the direction of travel is a, a necessity, but we have to understand the, the impacts and mitigate where possible as well. But on a lot of the areas of spend that I've been able to identify, whether it is on a transport or forestry or energy efficiency, actually jobs can be created by doing the right thing by uh, the environment in that um, a transition as well, or digital or renewables. Um, these are areas of uh, growth uh, and not necessarily the threat of job losses by that particular transition. However, and, and um, other colleagues would be better placed to, to debate this, um, in terms of the uh, detail as they understand it. But if some decisions were taken that might have an impact, then there would be an impact on jobs that we would want to understand. It would be very negative if we don't take the right decisions around that. So that is why, in the transition to low-carbon economy, we think about all of the impacts. But I just wanted the positives to be on the table as well. There are positive um, to come from this journey in addition to the environmental positives because of the leadership role it can give Scotland, the innovation and the jobs that come from more sustainable futures um, as well. But yes, if a, you know, Parliament or Government took a decision on no more types of industry, then those people in that industry might have something to say about it naturally, which I suspect is what Mr Scott is driving at. 
I'm just asking if you consider on balance if it, the effect on the jobs is likely to be positive or negative by this transition from the limited assessments that you've undertaken thus far. Ministers would always consider the full impact of decisions as they go forward. Sustainable economic growth considers people as well as um, infrastructure. Uh, but I just make the point that there are choices here and it's um, important to remember and keep in mind the impacts of all of those choices. Yep. Uh, last year's uh, analysis, the low to high analysis of the capital budget, uh, appears to have covered only 88% of the expenditure. Uh, what steps are being undertaken to get the last 12 per cent in, or what difficulties are there in doing that? Okay, um, part of that difficulty relates to the local government budget that I was just discussing with Mr Lyle. That's why that bit um, doesn't right. feature okay. uh, within it. Financial transactions is the other area. Uh, it covers the capital. CDL budget, capital budget only, not the financial transactions. So it's financial transactions that are not part of it, but all CDL is, with Other the exception of the local government. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to make sure I understand what's being said by financial transactions, is it suggested that there are financial transactions that have a measurable carbon impact? Probably a will, but it's hard to assess them, I suppose, because financial transactions are largely around... I'm sure, as the member knows, um, loans or equity schemes that comes from UK government, so we can only use them within the private sector for specific purposes. I mean, actually, you could, there'll probably be a range. I mean, it can be very micro as well. I mean, capital spend is spent on projects. Um, some of the financial transactions can be to individuals as well. Therefore, it might be quite hard to judge their full extent of whether it is high, medium or low carbon impact. So I think it's the complexity of the individual transactions, the reason that they weren't captured, to get to the point of, if you would want it in analysis, how do you get it there? Um, so just, just to be clear then, these are transactions that essentially just flow through the government's books untouched. To third would, parties, is that what I'm hearing? I, I wouldn't describe them in any shape or form that particular way in front of Treasury, um, but we, we use them to support particular policy objectives. Um, and Mr Seams and asked, you know, can we try and get them in that overall capital spend? They're, they're just quite different from that traditional capital spend. We know uh, ultimately what's being invested in through the capital programme, the capital spend, I've addressed the local government point, but financial transactions is down to specific projects and individuals. Some, I think there'll be a variety on the scale of their carbon impact. It might be worthwhile for us to do further work on this and respond to the committee wants to look at financial transactions, but I think their nature is more complex than traditional capital spend that you're judging that profile by. Um, so, so I'm understanding that many of these financial transactions essentially are money coming from the UK government that is essentially ring-fenced for a particular purpose. But nonetheless, the policy decision as to the detail of how it's spent is a matter for the Scottish government. Now, is that a correct yes. playback of what yes, I've just Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. So, so, so therefore, I think I may suggest to the Cabinet Secretary it would be proper for this committee and other committees to to explore that further. And I think, I think we'd probably welcome a better understanding because I think the label financial transactions, I suspect is probably one the accountants use, but is misleading for us in considering policy issues. No, I, well, I think that's helpful. I'm very clear on what financial transactions are, what they're used on, what I spend them, what I allocate them on. I just think it's quite complex to try and get them to fit into this process, but I'm happy to explore it and return to the committee so you have a deeper understanding of the carbon impact of financial transactions, because I do think it's complex, it's very variable. Um, you know, some can be help to buy schemes, for mm -hmm. example, so that mm -hmm. might be getting people to move mm -hmm. from essentially into better standard accommodation that might be more, uh, might have uh, lower emissions from that property, for example, or agricultural payments that's been used for loans. So there's a variety of uses for financial transactions. It doesn't fit uh, within this because the commitment specifically in the budget process last year was for capital spend and financial transactions are a different thing. If 
from your point of view, the committee wants to understand the carbon outputs coming from tran financial transactions. I'm happy to, again, uh, explore that and see if the committee wants to take it further. It's just more complex and it's not actually as close to the spirit of the commitment around the capital budget as I think committee thinks it is. Uh, cl clearly, I'm only speaking for myself because the committee as a whole has not discussed the matter, but I'm pretty confident that our colleagues would welcome some increased understanding okay. of what's going on here, while recognising that it won't be possible to pin down uh, every CO2 and other molecule. I can be. I'm happy to do more work on that for the purposes of the committee. Mark Ruskell. I, I agree, Mr. Stevenson. I think it'd be it'd be good to understand the nature of the opportunities here as well. <coughs> We've had, you know, information presented to us about what what local authorities have been doing, investing in low energy street lighting, for example. So. You know, loan funding obviously can bring about quite substantial change, and, and you mentioned agricultural subsidy again can bring change um, if there's cross compliance there with with climate or whatever. So it maybe is an area that's been over overlooked, and it'd be useful to get some analysis on it. And just being clear with the uh, committee, I mean, I'm answering the questions as accurately as I can. I'm, I'm just expressing when a question is asked about, you know, the, ca the commitment as it relates to the capital budget, and then we talk about a different system of finance, and I'm trying to give full some answers about that, mm -hmm. but also in the spirit of the question, I'm just trying to answer that, because I could point, I think you'll welcome some of the information around financial transactions, how they've actually been targeted towards low carbon purposes, whether that's investment by, say, higher or further education. So there's that the, the, there's ways we've tried to target it towards this agenda as well. It just doesn't neatly fit within the commitment that we were discussing. Um, moving on to another area, Richard has a question. Yeah, um, I think you covered the factor of local government data and any future reporting, but are you open to applying the same high to low analysis to any new infrastructure investment plan? And would you be open to including this analysis to the six-month updates that you already publish? Convener, I think I have partly covered that, that that's not the spirit of the agreement that we have with local government on the Concorda or the financial arrangements. I understand that you know this committee may well wish to recommend that or want that, but that's not the relationship that Scottish Government has with local government on how they spend their capital allocation and that to us in that sense, and then how they how if, if they would follow the same monitoring or evaluation regime as us. Uh, if that's a matter you wish to raise with local government, that, of course, would be up to you. If, if they want a national monitoring regime, I hear my doots. Um, but I think they're committed to this agenda, but I'm not sure that they would want government to oversee a monitoring regime of their capital spend. Um, so I'm not particularly keen to pursue that, but if that becomes a committee recommendation, of course, I would have to uh, consider that, but I have no plans so to do. John. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do you think there should be a policy target for the proportion of low carbon capital in the infrastructure pipeline or a ceiling for the proportion of high carbon capital expenditure? The I'm not particularly attracted to that because I think then that it would become quite formulaic. I think if we've set out a climate change plan that sets out very ambitious targets, how we deliver that, we're expected to work towards that. And I think separate to that is the, although aligned, but there's the commitment of direction of travel, of um, uh, low carbon spend. Um, so I think for those reasons, I think these are, these are good principles and all of our other understandings will help inform what we're doing, but I'm not particularly attracted to a further set of formula that might bind our inputs. I think we've been discussing over the course of the morning even how some immediate spend might bring long-term benefits, but that might even bind our hands to do that if we set an artificial cap or formula that then said, right, whatever you're doing on capital spend must fit within that. If all the other policy commitments, statutory obligations and commitments we've made are being followed, I think it's a very welcome direction of travel that the committee would support. So I'm not attracted to an additional formula or cap in that regard. I think I can well see why you'd want to retain as much flexibility as possible. Um, the annual carbon assessment of the draft budget does not present emissions associated with the capital budget separately from revenue, but the Scottish Government letter to the committee 
helpfully does this for the five-year financial strategy. Would you give this change in presentation consideration for future reports? So we can give that further thought, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd just like to, we've got some time in hand, so if, yes. Uh, you say you were, uh, sorry to come back in, but uh, you always wonder what I'm going to ask you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, you would say you were watching earlier on the television the, the witnesses. Um, on a question I asked, a point was made in the Scotland's Way Ahead project, and they recommended the creation of an independent Scottish Infrastructure Commission. Basically, I said that most organisations have a regulator. How important do you believe that an independent Scottish Infrastructure Commission, commission would be, and would you be in favour of it, or against it, or neutral? I, I, I now regret that with time in hand, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that doesn't mean you have to detain me any longer, <laughs> incidentally. Uh, but no, it's actually a very fair question. I, I think that, again, I would be stepping into other colleagues' um, areas of responsibility and, and uh, going beyond Cabinet approval as well to make a unilateral decision about whether we should have an independent process. What I would say, though, is um, the UK's Infrastructure Commission um, does look at UK-wide issues and uh, briefed um, uh, Michael Matheson and myself on their um, uh, views and recommendations. So it certainly serves a purpose. Um, you know, is it Scotland-specific? No, it's UK-wide. But I thought it, it spoke to very pertinent messages around uh, energy and digital and, and um, uh, infrastructure. So. I, I would have to defer to the Infrastructure Secretary to answer the question. Um, you know, do we appreciate independent advice to help influence government decisions? Of course we do. Do we like a deeper understanding of how our decisions are impacting both the environment and the economy? Of course we do. Um, but whether we need an independent Infrastructure Commission to do that, um, I wouldn't like to say, as I say, it would uh, go beyond um, my brief in an unfair way to speak to, to colleagues' interests. Uh, yes, if the, again, if the committee is making recommendations, of course, uh, government considers committee recommendations. Of course, we would consider it if that becomes your recommendation. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. So th that brings our, our panel to a close. Well, sorry, I was going to close, um, but make it very brief, and I'll, okay, I'll thank let you, you in. Your indulgence, come in. Um, I, I was thinking about the, 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 the uncertainty around climate change, um, because... You know, in a few weeks' time, we're going to get the uh, recommendations from the International Panel on Climate Change. That may well revise uh, the science and revise our understanding of what we need to do. Um, and obviously, these assessments come every every couple of years. So, how did how do you deal with that that kind of uncertainty? Because it seems that we need to build in to our action on climate change a certain amount of um, innovation and a certain amount of um, you know, focus in terms of going beyond where we are right now in terms of carbon reduction targets. So, how do you how do you respond to that? Because you've got a you know capital program, IIP. It's pretty clear. It's pretty fixed. But you know, up there, the science and the understanding of what's happening in the climate is changing. So, how do you kind of work with that un uncertainty? I, I, I again, um, cabinet would have to be alert and uh, alive to that prospect. But at least in the Scottish Government, you've got a government that listens to experts, takes this international challenge seriously, wants to be a world leader, and we have a parliament that feels the same, um, and therefore we have to be quite adept and agile to respond to whatever policies or international commitments emerge and what the technologies are to help us deliver that. I am very mindful of my exposure on this issue that the assessments, the evaluation, the statistics, uh, have all changed, you know, over a period of time internationally, and we've had to respond with that, understand our own baseline, our own contribution, and the policies that we're trying to achieve. And having done so much as a country, I mean, bear in mind we're on track, we've met our targets, and we've got, the most, I would argue, the most ambitious targets in the world. It does have to be resourced as well, and the policy changes have to follow, and that has been happening around energy, transport. Um, land use, and then all the other interventions that, that we make. We know that we've got much more to do, and that's why we have a plan, and it has to be resourced. But I think we have to be 
quite agile and adept to do that. Um, and ultimately, um, we will be advised again by the Cabinet Subcommittee if and when required, but it's about now getting on and delivering that plan, but being agile. Budgets are set annually, of course they are, um, but where I can, I'll try and set multi-year budgets because you can actually get greater value and greater certainty from multi-year budgets, but I am beholden to a UK spending cycle, not getting into the debate about real terms reductions, but a budget cycle that doesn't help me with long-term planning. But that said, there has been multi-year commitments around uh, infrastructure, housing, digital uh, utilities, um, and we want to do more of that. And if you look at specific investments, whether it's you know charging point, as I say, decarbonisation of transport, more uh, around rail um, or um, other elements of spend, green buses, um, or even just elements in the programme for government very recently have shown we're alive to this. And incidentally, we've spent, or we're on track to spend half a billion pounds on energy efficiency uh, over the period in this parliament, and surely that's to be welcomed as well. So it is keeping a focus on it, but being agile and um, we're absolutely committed to this agenda, and that's why we've tried to preserve the funds that are financing us, indeed expand them where, where appropriate. Um, and a, a smaller but substantial scale, uh, doubling the active travel budget um, was a substantial commitment as well in a period of financial challenge. So um, we want to make sure that the resources are aligned with the politics and the policies. Um, but, but, but it's very true to say that the international understanding may change again. At least what we know in Scotland we have is a consensus to do our bit and play our part, as opposed to ignore the challenges of climate change that some have chosen to do. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for coming along today. We're going to suspend the meeting briefly to move on to the next part and allow the uh, panel to leave. Thank you very much. Right, we now move on to agenda item five on subordinate legislation. The fifth item on the agenda is to consider the CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme, Revocation and Savings, Order 2018, SI 2018, Oblique 841. Um, more details on this negative instrument can be found in paper four. Do we have any comments on this? Claudia. A uh, quick comment. Thank you, convener. Just that any simplification, which I understand this to be, is always to be welcomed. Um, and it's more likely that people and organisations will be um, supportive of it if they can understand it more easily. Mark. Um, I had a bit of a question, really, convener, and it, it was really about um, the understanding of how this now impacts on the climate change levy. Because if, if the CRC goes, and I think it, you know, welcome that it, that it will go, it will add to, uh, lead to greater simplification. Um, and it's transferred into the CCL and the rates increase, then you know, what, what's the impact for that? Does Scotland get barnet consequentials as a result of that? Do we see the climate change levy at its increased level, um, could it's incorporated CRC then resulting in more um, spend coming back to Scotland? And I also just had a, a point read for the record just about why the climate change levy um, doesn't allow an exemption for renewables. Um, given that renewable energy is, you know, part of the solution to climate change, it shouldn't be getting, in my opinion, uh, taxed on its climate impact because it doesn't have a climate impact. Yeah. Well, those are questions that we can write as a committee to the government. Unless there's an obvious answer, yeah. Kavina, which um, I've missed somewhere. Okay. So, yeah. well, we'll look into that, and if there isn't an obvious answer, then we'll, we'll, we'll certainly ask for one. Thank you. Okay. Right. Does the committee agree that it doesn't want to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Yeah. 
Okay, so it just leaves me to mention the future meeting details. Um, next meeting is on the 18th of September and the committee will consider the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at stage two. Can I remind members that the final deadline for submission of amendments is 12 noon on Wednesday the 12th? Tuesday. Tuesday. Sorry, Sorry, Tuesday. That's, it was, I do apologise, that's a mistake in my notes. Tuesday, which is today at 12 noon. Um, as agreed earlier, the committee will now move into private session and I request that the public gallery be vacated as, part, as the public part of the meeting is now closed. <laughs>